Good morning. I'm Thomas Kamei from San Francisco. I'm 17 years old, and this is my 10th consecutive annual meeting. You must be a PhD by now, at least. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Buffett and Mr. Munger, I'm curious about what you think is the best way to become a better investor. Should I get an MBA? Get more war experience? Read more Charlie Munger almanacs? Or merely is it genetic and out of my hands? Well, I think you should read everything you can. Uh, I, can I can tell you in my own case, I think by the time I was, well, I know by the time I was uh, 10, I'd read every book in the Alma Public Library that had anything to do with investing, and many of them I'd read twice. So I don't think there's anything like reading, uh, uh, and not just as limited to investing at all, but uh, you just got to fill up your mind with various competing thoughts and sort them out as to, as to what uh, really makes sense over time. And then once you've done a lot of that, I think you have to jump in the water because investing on paper and doing, you know, and, and, and investing with real money, you know, is like the difference between reading a romance novel and doing something else. So I, I, I would, I, I, there, there is nothing like actually uh, uh, having a little experience in investing. Uh, and, and you soon find out whether you like it. If you like it, if it turns you on, you know, you're probably going to do well on it. But, and the earlier you start, uh, the better in terms of reading. But, you know, I read a book at age 19 that formed my framework for thinking about investments ever since. I mean, what I am doing today at 76 is running things through the same thought pattern that I got from a book I read when I was 19. And I read all the other books too, but if you, and you have to read a lot of them to know which ones really do jump out at you and which ideas jump out at you over time. So I would say that uh, read and, and then on a small scale in a way that can't hurt you financially, uh, do some of it yourself. Charlie? Well, uh, Sandy Gottesman, who is a Berkshire director, runs a large and successful investment operation. And you can tell what he thinks causes people to learn to be good investors by noticing his employment practices. When a young man comes to Sandy, he asks a very simple question, no matter how young the man is. He says, what do you own and why do you own it? And if you haven't been interested enough in the subject, to uh, have that involvement already, why he'd rather you go somewhere else. Yeah. It's very, that whole idea that you, you own a business, you know, is vital to the investment process. I and mean, if you were gonna buy a farm, you'd say I'm buying this 160 acre farm because I expect that the farm will produce 120 bushels uh, an acre of corn or 45 bushels an acre of soybeans and I can buy the fertile, you know, you go through the whole process. It'd be, a, it'd be a quantitative decision, and it would be based on pretty solid stuff. It would not be based on, you know, what you saw on television that day. It would not be based on, you know, what your neighbor said to you or anything of the sort. It's the same thing with stocks. I used to always recommend to my students that they take a yellow pad like this, and if they're buying 100 shares of General Motors at 30, and General Motors has whatever it has out, 600 million shares or a little less, that they say, I'm, I'm going to buy the General Motors Company for $18 billion, and here's why. And if they can't write a good essay on that subject, they've got no business buying 100 shares or 10 shares or one share at $30 per share because they, they are not subjecting it to business tests. And to get in the habit of thinking that way, you know, Sandy would have followed it up with the questions based on how you answered the first two questions that made you defend exactly why you thought that business was cheap at the price at which you were buying it. And any other answer, you'd flunk. Number 11, naked shorting, I think is the question. Um, I don't know exactly, I've, I've never been in a position where I've asked a, a broker from whom I bought stock to give me the certificate and had them decline it for any period of time. I would think that, that you might have some action against them but I've never, I do not see the problem at all with 
with people shorting stocks. I mean, I, I would welcome people shorting Berkshire Hathaway. I mean, it, it, uh, if you own stock and they need to borrow from you, you can get some extra income from your stock. And the one sure buyer of your stock eventually is somebody who shorted it. I mean, that guy's going to buy it someday. Uh, and I have no, I have no problem with, with shorts. If there's some kind of a game that's played, uh, uh, and I've read about it, I've never seen it happen to anything that we've owned. Uh, like I say, if anybody wants to naked short, Berkshire Hathaway, they can do it till the cows come home, and, and we'll, be, uh, we'll be happy to, and we'll have a special meeting for them. Uh, but, uh, and I, I would say this, the shorts generally have the tougher time of it in this world. I mean, there are more people bullying stocks for phony reasons than there are bearing stocks uh, for phony reasons. So I, I do not see shorts as any great threat to the world. If, 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 if enough people shorted Berkshire stock, they would have to borrow it, and they would pay you to borrow your stock, and that's, just, that's found money. We did that on USG. When USG got hammered after uh, uh, they went into bankruptcy, or maybe just before, um, one large brokerage firm came to us and they wanted us to lend them uh, millions of shares, and they paid us a lot of money. And we happily lent them the stock. We wish they borrowed more. In fact, we insisted that they borrowed for a given length of time just so that we could collect a, a large premium. And I don't know how many, I'd have to look it up, but you know, I don't know whether it's in the hundred thousands or maybe low millions, but we were better off. And they didn't do too well shorting USG at $4 a share either, but it, it was immaterial to us. Uh, so I do not regard I do not regard shorts as, it's a tough way to make a living. Uh, uh, it's very easy to spot phony stocks and promoted stocks, but it's very hard to tell when that'll turn around. And, and uh, somebody that's promoted a stock to five times what it's worth may very well promote it to 10 times what it's worth. And if you're short, that can get very painful. Uh, Charlie, do you have any thoughts on shorting? Well, not on shorting, but those delays in, in delivering sometimes reflect a tremendous slop in the clearance process. And it is not good for a civilization to have a huge slop in the clearance processes for its security trades. That would be sort of like having a lot of slop in the management of your atomic power plants. It's not a good idea to have, have slop that causes a lot of financial exposure that people are ignoring. Charlie, uh, reach back into your law uh, practice. If I buy a thousand shares of General Motors and my broker doesn't deliver it to me, and I ask him to deliver it and he doesn't deliver it to me after a week or two weeks or three weeks, what's the situation? Well, if you're a private customer, you may wait a while. And it, it, the, a lot of the other trades uh, 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 clearance systems do cause people to put up collateral and, and so on, but uh, uh, a lot of uh, take derivative trading. There's a lot of slop in derivative trading, and the clearance problem would be awful if a lot of people wanted to do something at once. But if I demand delivery after three weeks, can I bring, can, I, can I walk into court and? Say, I want my stock, I've given you the money? I don't think there's any court that can hand you your stocking mm -hmm. certificate just because you want it. No, mm -hmm. if the clearance system is failing you, I, mm -hmm. you can scream a lot, and you may have some ultimate remedy, but, but there's... Uh, 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 I'll get somebody else to represent me. <laughs> <laughs> Number nine. Hello? Hello, my name is Johann Freudenberg from Hanover, Germany. Do you think gambling companies will have a great future? Thank you. What kind of companies? Gambling companies. Gambling companies, well, gambling companies will have a terrific future if they're legal. That, you know, which ones or anything, I don't know anything about that. But desire of people to gamble, 
and they gamble in stocks, incidentally, too. Uh, day trading, I would say, in, in very often was came very close to uh, gambling as defined. Uh, uh, but people people like to gamble. You know, I mean, it's uh, it, if if the Super Bowl is on. Or even, well, the, better yet, if a terribly boring football game is on, but you don't have anything to do, uh, and you're sitting there with somebody else, you're probably going to enjoy the game more if you bet a few bucks on it one way or the other. Uh, as you know, I mean, we insure hurricanes, so I watch the Weather Channel, but that's a, uh, it can be exciting. <laughs> uh, but people, the, the, the human propensity to gamble is, is huge. Now, when it was legalized only in pretty much in Nevada, you had to go to some distance or break some laws to do any serious gambling. But as the states learned to, uh, you know, what a great source of, of uh, revenue it was, uh, they gradually made it easier and easier and easier for people to gamble. And believe me, the easier it's made, uh, the more people will gamble. I mean, when I was, what, my my children are here, and 40 years ago, uh, I bought a slot machine, and I put it up on our third floor. And I could give my kids any allowance they wanted as long as it was in dimes. I mean, I had it all back by nightfall. Uh, I, th I thought it would be a good lesson for them. And, uh, now, they weren't going to Las Vegas to do it, but believe me, when it was on the third floor, they could find it, you know. And, uh, and my payout ratio was terrible, too, but that's the kind of father I was. Uh, the, uh, but gambling, you know, people are always going to want to do it. And uh, for that reason, I particularly think that access, you know, in terms of friendly gambling or anything like that, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm not a prude about it. But I do think that to quite an extent, gambling is a tax on ignorance. I mean, if you want to, if you want to tax the, the ignorant, people who will do things with the odds against them. You know, you just put it in and guys like me don't have to pay taxes. And I, I, I really don't, I find that, I, I find it kind of socially re revolting when a, gover a government preys on the weaknesses of its citizenry rather than acts to serve them. And, and believe me, when a government sticks a lot, you know, I, uh, When a, when a government makes it easy for people to take their social security checks and start pulling handles uh, or participating in lotteries or whatever it may be, it, it's a pretty cynical act. It works. It's a pretty cynical act. And it, uh, it, it, uh, it relieves taxes on those, you know, who, who, who don't fall for those and, or, or, who don't, or who aren't dreaming about having a car instead of actually having a car or dreaming about a color TV instead of having one. Uh, so it's, it's not government at its best, and I think other things flow from that over time, too. Charlie? Yeah, I would argue that the gambling casinos use clever psychological tricks to cause people to hurt themselves. There is undoubtedly a lot of harmless amusement in the casinos, but there's also a lot of grievous injury that is deliberately caused by the casinos. It's a dirty business, and I don't think you'll find a casino soon in Berkshire Hathaway. Mm. Number 10, please. 